Uh, good morning and welcome to this uh, MAA invited address. Uh, I'm Scott Chapman. I'll be your moderator today. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker. Uh, early in my career, I was really fortunate to have uh, the opportunity to run several REU programs. And in the course of doing that, I uh, was able to interact with a lot of really talented and highly motivated students that uh, went on to uh, get their PhD degrees. And to this day, I count many of them as, as some of my most valuable uh, professional acquaintances. And so uh, it gives me great pleasure today uh, to introduce one of those students uh, to give this address. Uh, Nathan Kaplan is a native of Brooklyn and he shows his New York stripes to this day where he is still one of the world's most loyal Mets and Jets fans. And those of you that follow football know how hard it is to be a Jets fan. So he needs credit for that. Uh, he completed his undergraduate degree in 2007 at Princeton. And in his senior year, he was awarded the department's Greenberg Memorial Prize for excellence in mathematics. During his undergraduate years, he completed two other REU programs, uh, other than the one he worked with uh, under me, uh, at Williams College in Minnesota Duluth. Those programs led to three research level publications, uh, which uh, led to his being named winner of the Morgan Prize uh, in uh, 2008. Uh, after Princeton, he completed the TRIPOS III program at Cambridge. And shortly thereafter, he enrolled at Harvard, where in 2013, he completed his PhD degree, uh, writing a thesis on finite fields and coding theory under Noam Elkies. Uh, he spent two years, 2013, 2015 at Yale uh, as the Gibbs assistant professor. And he then uh, uh, accepted a position at UC Irvine, where he is currently an associate professor of mathematics. He's published widely in number theory, both algebraic and rational, coding theory, combinatorial algebra, graph theory, and algebraic geometry. And aside from his uh, numerous uh, research level publications, he's also published in popular journals like Math Magazine and the American Math Monthly. Since he started at Irvine, he has delivered a long list of outreach and general interest talks to the mathematical community. And one of his major research level publications, which appeared in the Journal of Commutative Algebra, was written with a high school student. Uh, even at this early point in his career, he has uh, directed numerous doctoral students and uh, directed several undergraduate research projects. And this may not be the first time you've ever seen Nathan. He has appeared on numerous television game shows, including Who Wants to Be a Millionaire and Jeopardy, where on Jeopardy, he won a thrilling sudden death match answering a question in science. So please join me in welcoming to the joint meetings, Nathan Kaplan, who will speak on codes from polynomials over finite fields. Scott, thank you so much for the introduction and thanks everybody for coming. Also, thank you to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak here. I know this is a weird situation, but I got to go to some really great talks yesterday and I'm hoping that the virtual joint meetings ends up being a really positive experience. So I first just wanna point out that uh, I wrote a message that should be in the chat that has some links that are relevant to this talk. So for one thing, there are a link to the slides for this talk. So you can follow along at your own pace. Maybe you want to go back to a slide that I skipped over, and there are also a bunch of references. So uh, my background is primarily in number theory. So why am I giving a talk about coding theory? So coding theory is a subject that has real importance in the real world. Problems in communication, information theory, lots of connections to computer science, but it's also a subject where there's really beautiful interactions with algebraic geometry, number theory, combinatorics, and lots of other areas of mathematics. And another thing that I really like about this subject is that it's accessible, that it doesn't have the same difficult technical barriers to entry as some problems in 
number theory and algebraic geometry. So you can explain some current problems of research interest to motivated undergraduates. And there's also a lot of opportunity to do some programming, work with explicit examples, and get students involved. So last thing before I jump into it, I'm organizing a session tomorrow. Uh, and we have a great list of speakers who are going to talk about a diverse set of topics. Uh, I hope that if you like this talk, you're motivated to come and check out the session and see some of the ways that coding theory interacts with other areas. So here we go. I want to have one slide about communication. And let's suppose that you want to communicate over a noisy channel. The idea is I want to send you a message. And to make this as simple as possible, that message will be a single bit, a 0 or a 1. And we're communicating over the radio or over the internet. And the idea is that when I send a bit, there's some fixed probability that that bit gets corrupted. So let's say that if I send you a 0, there's a 90% chance you get a 0. But there's a 10% chance that something goes wrong and you instead get a 1. Same thing, if I send you a 1, 90% chance you get a 1, 10% chance you get a 0. So I don't know, 90%, that's pretty good. But maybe for some applications, 10% probability of error is too high, and you're not willing to live with that. For example, maybe 0 means fire the missiles, and 1 means do not fire those missiles, and 10% is too much. So one idea is that instead of sending a single 0 or 1, I'm going to take this message and repeat it. I'll send you 0, 0, 0, or 1, 1, 1. And let's suppose that every time I send a bit, there's this fixed probability of error, and those probabilities are independent. So if we agree to this scheme and you receive 0, 1, 0, what do you do? Well, you can figure out the probability that I meant to send you 0, 0, 0, and there was one error and see that that is higher than the probability that I meant to send you 1, 1, 1, and there were two errors. So you'll decode this message as 0, 0, 0. And uh, if there was only 0 or 1 errors, you'll decode the message correctly. Two or more, and all is lost. So with this send a 0, send a 1 scheme, there's a 90% chance that you get the right message. And in this repetition scheme, you can compute that if there are no errors, or if there is exactly one error, you get the correct message. So the probability that you get the right message goes up from 90% to 97%. But there's a cost to this increased reliability, which is you have to send three bits instead of one. So maybe that cost is literally a cost, that it costs money to send information, or maybe it's something like time. So one of the major questions in coding theory is, how do you efficiently build redundancy into our set of messages so that we can identify and correct errors? We need this redundancy to correct errors, but we want it to be efficient. So now we'll switch from having our messages just be strings of zeros and ones to a more algebraic perspective. Let's let FQ be a finite field of size Q. And if you're less algebraically inclined, maybe you're a student in my algebra course right now, and we just haven't talked about finite fields yet. You won't lose much by just every time you see an FQ, think of Z mod PZ for a prime P. That'll be OK for most of the talk. A code over FQ of length n is nothing more than a subset of FQ to the n. Think of the code as the set of messages that we agree to send. That code is a linear code if it is a linear subspace of FQ to the n. That is, if you have two elements, C1 and C2, in your code, you also have C1 plus C2. And if you have C1 in your code and alpha and FQ, you also have that scalar alpha times C1. One of the things that gets coding theory going as a subject is the Hamming distance on FQ to the n. So if you have two elements, x and y, in FQ to the n, say coordinates x1 up through xn, y1 up through yn, the Hamming distance between them is the number of coordinates i where xi is not equal to yi. It's the number of coordinates where they're not the same. There is a Hamming distance that gets a special name. The Hamming weight of x is the distance from x to the all zero code word. So it's the number of coordinates of x that are not equal to zero. So just to use this repetition example, 
0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, that's a one-dimensional linear subspace of F2 cubed. There are two distinct words in this subspace, and the distance between them is three. So one of the main things that says whether a code is good or interesting is the minimum distance of the code, which is you vary over all pairs of distinct elements, x and y, in your code, and you take the minimum possible Hamming distance that occurs. If C is a linear code, then you can see that this Hamming, minimum Hamming distance is the same as the minimum weight of a non-zero code word. Why? Because the distance between a pair x and y is the same as the distance between x minus y and y minus y. And y minus y is 0. And so the distance between x minus y and y minus y is the weight of x minus y. If your code is linear and you have this pair x and y, then you also have the pair x minus y and 0. Why is this such a big deal? Well, if you start at a code word that has minimum distance in a code that has minimum distance d, and you change at most d minus 1 over 2 things, then you're still closer to that code word than any other code word. So that means that you'll be able to identify and correct up to d minus 1 over 2 floor errors. So in this example of this one-dimensional linear code in F2 cubed, you can correct up to 3 minus 1 over 2, one error. OK, what do we want? So we have a code in Fq to the n, and we want it to be large. If we're going to send n elements of a finite field, we want to be able to send lots of messages, that there isn't too much redundancy. But we also want there to be a large minimum distance. We want to be able to correct lots of errors. And these two things are clearly pushing on each other. You can find pairs of elements in Fq to the n that have distance n between each other that are very spread out. But you can't find a large subset of Fq to the n so that every pair is that spread out. So we'll define this function, a, q, n, d. And this is the maximum size of a code, c, in fq to the n that has minimum distance at least d. And I saw this phrase in a paper of Scriver. The main problem in combinatorial coding theory is to compute values of this function. And to give you a feeling for what this looks like, I've uh, put up the title and abstract of a paper of Ostergaard from 2011. And the thing that is proven in this paper is that a2178 is 36. That is the maximum size of a subset of f2 to the 17th such that any two elements differ in at least eight positions is 36. So in the abstract, it says that there is a construction of 36 such elements. And we know that there are not 38 or more such elements. So the whole thing in this paper is to show that there do not exist 37 elements that are binary strings of length 17 such that any two of them differ in at least eight positions. And that sounds like a finite computation, and it is. But there is a lot of subsets of size 37 in F2 to the 17th. So it's not so clear that you can just put it in your computer and do it. So this is a place where you can explain this to students and like have them play around with it, try some things, and see where it goes. OK, so let me give you a, a bigger view of what this looks like. So this is a chart taken from Brower's tables of upper and lower bounds for A2 and D. And uh, down the side, we have the length of the code. And across the top, we have these minimum distances. And for the eagle-eyed among you in the audience, you may notice in the row 17 and the column D equals 8, you see Ostergaard's 36 right in the middle. So in some sense, the first open case is right to the left of it. What is the maximum size of a subset of F2 to the 17th such that any two elements differ in at least six positions? Well, that should be larger because we're asking them to be less spread out, these code words. And the best construction we have is size 258. And the best upper bound we know is size 340. So there's a lot of room to bring these together. And this is something you could have students play around with. These problems are accessible. They're very not easy, but they make sense. 
So from now on, pretty much for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about linear codes. You can ask the totally analogous question. So here's a table from codetables.de, which uh, is similar but presented in a different way. So down one side, you have the length of the code. Across the top, you have the dimension of your linear code. And each entry is what is the maximum possible minimum distance for a k-dimensional linear subspace of f2 to the n. So here, if you go way down to the bottom to the row 35 and the column 10 in the middle, you'll see maybe the first open case, which is we know an example of a 10-dimensional linear subspace of f2 to the 35th with minimum distance 12. We know that there is no such subspace with minimum distance 14 or more. So the whole question is, does there exist a 10-dimensional linear subspace of f2 to the 35th with minimum distance at least uh, 13, or exactly 13. OK, so how do you start to answer these kinds of questions? Uh, the next main thing that I'm going to talk about is the subject of the talk, codes from polynomials over finite fields and the Reed-Solomon codes. But instead of jumping right into the definition of a Reed-Solomon code, I'm going to tell you what an MDS code is. And I'm going to start by proving this singleton bound, one of these upper bounds on A, Q, and D. And I like this because it's one of those places where it's not totally obvious whether it's called the singleton bound because there's like a singleton, like one thing that you're doing something to in this argument, or whether singleton is a person. It's like a leech lattice killing form type of a situation. Singleton is a person. The name is in blue. I'm going to do that throughout the talk. So the bound says that A, Q, and D is at most Q to the N minus D minus 1. And people say that every talk should have one proof. I don't know that I believe that, but I want to do this proof because it's nice. So here's the idea. Let's take a code in FQ to the N that is as large as possible, that has size A, Q, and D, and minimum distance at least D. Let's take all the code words and write them down. I like to think of them in a vertical array, like in a stack. Let's choose any D minus 1 coordinates, say the first D minus 1 coordinates, and erase them. What do we have? So we used to have a bunch of elements of fq to the n, but we erased d minus 1 coordinates. So now we have a bunch of elements of fq to the n minus d minus 1. And because, I mean, well, how many elements do we have? We still have a, q, and d elements. And because any two of our initial elements were different in at least d positions, when we erase d minus 1 things, there's always still at least one thing distinguishing between any pair. So that means that we have a bunch of different elements in fq to the n minus d minus 1. And that's it. That's the whole proof. And this proof is so straightforward that maybe you feel like this bound can't possibly be any good because we didn't do anything. But codes for which equality holds in this bound get a name. They're called maximum distance separable or MDS codes. So it would be very weird if they had this name and they didn't exist. So the next thing that I should do is give you an example. So now I'll talk about Reed-Solomon codes. What we're going to do is choose an ordering p1, p2 up to pq of the elements of fq. And if q is a prime, feel free to choose 0, 1, 2 up to p minus 1. But you don't have to make that choice. You could pick anything as long as you make a choice and stick with it. Now we're going to take all the polynomials in fq bracket x of degree at most d. So polynomials with coefficients in fq, degree at most d. And we'll define this evaluation map that takes a polynomial f and sends it to f of p1, f of p2, up to f of pq. That's an element of fq to the q. You can see that if you take the sum of two polynomials and evaluate, that's the same thing that you would get as if you evaluated f, evaluated g, and added those two things together as elements of fq to the q. Same idea. Evaluate a scalar times a polynomial, you get alpha times the evaluation of f. So the image is a linear code. This is the Reed-Solomon code of length q and order d, which I'll call rsqd. How big is it? Well. As long as there's no polynomial that vanishes at every element of fq, this map is injective. So the dimension of the image is the dimension of vd, 
which is d plus one. So I just want to note that x to the q minus q does vanish at every element of fq. So we want to suppose from now until the end of time that q is bigger than d. It would be really weird if I defined an MDS code, say that there were examples, defined a Reed Solomon code, and then they turned out not to be an example. But you are in luck because Reed Solomon codes are MDS. And we just need one fact from algebra, which is if you have a field F and a polynomial in F bracket X of degree D, it has at most D distinct roots in F. Let's use this to see that the Reed Solomon codes are MDS. If you take two polynomials f and g, each of degree at most d, their difference has degree at most d. So either it's 0 or it has at most d roots in fq. That means f and g, if they're different polynomials, they can't match up in too many places because then their difference would have too many roots. So what does that mean? Two polynomials agree in at most d places if they're different which means that they don't agree in at least q minus d places. So the minimum distance of this code is q minus d. And if you compute the size of the code compared to q to the length minus minimum distance minus 1, you see that these are MDS codes. OK, so now I want to take a little detour and talk about my favorite conjecture. So as a number theorist, I know that my favorite conjecture is supposed to be the Riemann hypothesis or something, but I don't know how to prove the Riemann hypothesis. And I don't know how to prove this conjecture either, but I so don't know how to prove the Riemann hypothesis that I don't think about it. This conjecture, I think about a lot. So let me tell you what it's about. So we'll define this function mkq, which is going to be the maximum length n such that there exists a k-dimensional linear MDS code, C, in fq to the n. So think q is fixed. We're fixing k, the dimension, and we're asking for the longest possible MDS code. And this conjecture, which is sometimes called the main conjecture for MDS codes and goes back to the 1950s, says that, OK, if q is less than or equal to k, this maximum length should be k plus 1. This is pretty straightforward. I will leave it as an exercise. Uh, and now let's suppose that q is bigger than k. And the conjecture says if q is even and k equals 3 or k equals q minus 1, this maximum length is q plus 2. And in every other case, it should be q plus 1. And the example of the Reed Solomon codes that we saw shows that when q is bigger than d, md plus 1q is at least q. So it's not the maximum in the conjecture, but it's close. So Coding theory lends itself so well to explicit examples, I want to write down an example. Let's say q equals 5, d equals 2. So we have this Reed Solomon code that comes from evaluating polynomials of degree at most 2 with coefficients in f5. We get a three dimensional linear subspace of f5 to the fifth. You can choose a basis for this space of polynomials. My favorite basis for polynomials of degree at most 2 is 1, x, and x squared. And a three-dimensional linear subspace of f5 to the fifth is the row span of a three by five matrix. And it's not hard to see that if you choose a basis for the space of polynomials and evaluate, that will give you a basis for the subspace. So this matrix I wrote down, you get by taking one and evaluating, x and evaluating for the next row, and x squared and evaluating for the third row. What does it mean that the minimum distance is q minus d, is 5 minus 2 is 3. That means that no non-zero linear combination of these rows has zeros in three or more coordinates. So what would it mean to have zeros in the first three coordinates? You take some linear combination of the rows, you get 0, 0, 0 in the first three coordinates. That has nothing to do with the last two columns of this matrix, so forget them. That means that this 3 by 3 submatrix given by the first three columns, has determinant 0. So this condition about the minimum distance is the same as saying no 3 by 3 submatrix has determinant 0. So let me just ask a question, which is, can you add another column to this matrix to get a larger matrix with this property? 3 by 6 matrix entries in F5, no 3 by 3 submatrix with determinant 0. 
that's almost exactly the same question as asking, is there a three-dimensional MDS code, C, now an F5 to the sixth, where you erase the last coordinate and you pick up this Reed Solomon code? OK, yes, no? Yes. So here's the idea, doubly extended or projective Reed Solomon codes. You take a polynomial of degree D, you write out its coefficients, A, D, X to the D, plus, plus, plus. We're going to consider this very slightly modified evaluation map that sends F to F of P1, F of P2, up to F of PQ. First, same, first Q coordinates are the same. And then you're also going to throw in A, D, the X to the D coefficient. You can check for the same reasons as before. This map, the image is a linear subspace. If Q is bigger than D, this map is still injective. So the dimension of the subspace is D plus 1. And the important thing is the image is still an MDS code. If you have two polynomials that have the same x to the d coefficient, then not only does their difference have degree at most d, it has degree less than d. So either the difference is 0, or it has at most d minus 1 roots. So this image is called a doubly extended or projective Reed-Solomon code. And uh, I apologize for the notation. The thing that is classically called a Reed-Solomon code usually comes from evaluating not at every point of FQ, but at points of FQ star. So the thing that I'm calling a Reed-Solomon code often is called an extended Reed-Solomon code. And this one we extended one more. I prefer the term projective, but I've made a decision not to talk about projective space over finite fields in this talk at all for people who are comfortable with this. There is a natural way to think of this as taking not polynomials in one variable of degree at most d, but homogeneous polynomials of degree d in two variables and evaluating at a choice of affine representatives for the points of p1 of fq. If that's not familiar to you, forget it. Doesn't matter. OK, so just going back to this example, here it is with this now extra column that comes from this x squared coefficient. So we have our polynomials 1x x squared, and the x coefficient, the x squared coefficients are 0, 0, 1. Same properties hold. No 3 by 3 submatrix has determinant 0. This gives a three-dimensional MDS code C in F5 to the sixth. And it's not so hard to show that there isn't a longer one. So what this is saying is one value of this function, that M35 really is 6. So let me just go back to what the main conjecture for MDS codes is about. You have a k-dimensional linear subspace of fq to the n. It is the row span of a k by n matrix. That matrix gives you an MDS code if and only if every non-zero linear combination of the rows has at most k minus 1 coordinates equal to 0, which is the same thing as saying that no k by k submatrix has determinant 0. So this question about MDS codes that are as long as possible, you can now phrase just as a linear algebra problem that will make sense to students in uh, like a graduate algebra course. What is the maximum n for which there exists a k by n matrix with entries in FQ such that no k by k submatrix has determinant 0? And I just want to end this section of the talk by uh, putting this conjecture back up here. And I'll say that I don't want to give, oh, OK. So first, I want to say that this doubly extended Reed-Solomon code now gives us m d plus 1 q is greater than or equal to q plus 1. And that is supposed to be the right value in almost all cases. So one way to think about this conjecture is that you can't find longer MDS codes than the ones that come from Reed-Solomon codes. And we know a lot about this conjecture. I'm not going to write like a full overview of what we know, but we know that this is true when k is small. We know this is true when q is sufficiently large relative to k. And maybe most interestingly, there's this cool paper of Simeon Ball from 2012 that shows that this is true when q is prime, that the open case is when q is a prime power that is not a prime. And let me say for this second thing where q is even and k equals 3, this is related to some really neat, like funny algebraic geometry stuff and positive characteristic where there are things that happen with curves in characteristic 2 that just don't happen in other characteristics. So I don't know if you all have a favorite 
uh, five by 10 matrix with entries in F9, but I do because you might ask for a stronger statement, like maybe this conjecture is true and you can't find uh, MDS codes longer than the Reed Solomon codes. Maybe a stronger thing is true that every one of these MDS codes of maximum length comes from a Reed Solomon code. There are uh, parameters for which that is true, but not always. There is this cool example due to Glenn that's connected to all sorts of like funny algebraic geometry and positive characteristic stuff that is a five dimensional MDS code in F9 to the 10th that does not come from a Reed Solomon code. Okay. What else is there? So we've talked about polynomials in one variable and the codes that they give. And I like polynomials in one variable with coefficients in FQ, but I love polynomials in two variables with coefficients in FQ. So that's an idea. Let's go from one variable to more variables. And that takes us from Reed Solomon codes to Reed Muller codes. We're going to give a totally parallel setup. We'll pick an ordering of the points of FQ to the n. We'll consider the vector space of all polynomials in x1 up through xn of degree at most d. Uh, how big is that space? It's like a combinatorics one counting with repetition stars and bars arguments to see that that has dimension n plus d choose d. We define this evaluation map where you take f to f of p1, f of p2, up to f of p q to the n. Same idea as before, the image is a linear code. Same idea as before. As long as there's no polynomial of degree d vanishing at all the points of fq to the n, this map is injective. And that certainly is true when q is bigger than d. So this image is called the Reed Muller code RMQDN, and it has dimension n plus d choose d. So let me point out that there's another parameter here. So now we have q, we have the number of variables, and we have the degree. And if you set the number of variables equal to one, we are exactly in the situation of the Reed Solomon codes from before. Okay. So, like, what's up with these codes? Are they any, oh, what's up with these codes? Are they any good? What is the minimum distance of this code? That's the same question as asking for the maximum number of zeros of a polynomial of degree at most d in n variables. And here's an idea. Let's take alpha 1 through alpha d to be distinct elements of fq. And let's make a polynomial that is a polynomial in one variable that is a polynomial in n variables, but actually really is a polynomial in one variable. x1 minus alpha 1 times x1 minus alpha 2 times 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 x1 minus alpha d. How many zeros does this have? If x1 is one of these d special values, it's 0. It doesn't matter what x2 up through xn are. And if it's not one of those values, it's not zero. So it vanishes at q, or sorry, at d times q to the n minus one elements of fq. And now you have to do something, but you can see that this is as big as possible, that this gives the minimum distance of the code, which is q minus d times q to the n minus one. And if you compare the size of this code that we know to q to the length minus minimum distance minus one, you will see that when n is bigger than 1, these codes are very far from being MDS. So in some sense, these codes aren't that good for error correction minimum distance. But one thing to note is that these polynomials with this many zeros are very special. They're like highly reducible. So most polynomials don't look like this. Maybe I'm not concerned with the 1% of polynomials that have all the roots for themselves, but I want to know, like, what about the masses of polynomials? So maybe I want to know like how many polynomials have this give code words with this minimum weight, or more generally, even what is the distribution of the weights of these elements that come from evaluating polynomials? And that's my little motivation for talking about weight enumerators of these codes. So what is that? So uh, where are my slides? So what is that? So the Hamming weight enumerator of a code C in FQ to the N is a homogeneous polynomial in two variables, X and Y, that you can think of as a generating function that keeps track of the number of elements of given weight. 
So you sum over all elements C in your code, X to the N minus the weight, that's X to the number of zeros, times Y to the weight, which is number of non-zeros. You can group all the things of given weight together and think of this as a sum from I equals zero to N of AI times X to the N minus I, Y to the I. So AI is the number of elements in your code of weight I. For this one dimensional linear subspace in F2 cubed with two elements, you can see that the weight enumerator is just X cubed weight zero plus Y cubed weight three. So what is the weight enumerator of the Reed Solomon code, RSQD. This is the same thing pretty much as asking for the number of polynomials in FQ bracket X of degree at most D with exactly M distinct roots in FQ. And uh, there are a ton of interesting things about factorization statistics for polynomials in FQ bracket X. Like for example, maybe in a graduate algebra class, you saw something like the number of irreducible polynomials of degree D in FQ bracket X. This is actually easier than that. The idea is if you want a polynomial that vanishes at M places, pick your M places and count polynomials of degree at most D that vanish there. So you vary over all your choices of M places and you have to throw some things out because you included some polynomials that vanish at more than M places. But this is a place where you can make an inclusion exclusion argument that works really well. So I'll leave it to you. Maybe more interestingly, is you can run the same style of argument for any MDS code, even one that doesn't come from evaluating polynomials. So the statement is that the weight enumerator of a k-dimensional linear MDS code, C and FQ to the n, is determined by k, q, and n. And you can find this statement in a bunch of uh, coding theory textbooks like the ones behind me. So I will leave it to you to think about it. OK, so what else? So we know weight enumerators for polynomials in one variable. If you switch and look at more variables, maybe you look at an arbitrary number of variables n, but you want polynomials of degree 1. That's pretty straightforward, so I'll leave that to you to think about. And if you go from degree 1 to degree 2, things get more interesting. Computing the weight enumerator of this code that comes from evaluating polynomials of degree at most 2 and n variables is some uh, question counting problem about quadratic forms over finite fields. So you start to see like more number theory come in. And I've just put up this example for uh, d equals 2, n equals 2, not because it's important what exactly it is, but just to give you like a feel for what these weight enumerators look like. You can go case by case and see how many polynomials in two variables there are uh, of degree 2 of given type and you can get to this point. So what I'll say is there's some interesting stuff here that uh, we understand. But I want to move from degree 2 to degree 3. So this is what I really like as a number theorist. So read Muller codes that come from cubic curves. Let's take cubic polynomials or polynomials of degree at most 3 in two variables and make a code out of them. You can ask how many of these polynomials in FQ bracket XY of degree at most three have a given number of zeros. And at some point, it's helpful to switch your perspective a little bit from counting polynomials with a given number of zeros to looking at the curve defined by setting that polynomial equal to zero and asking about how many curves have a given number of rational points. And if you're going to count all the curves, at some point, you know, you'll first count the ones that are reducible, that the polynomial factors nicely. But at some point, you have to count the ones that don't factor, the ones where the curve is smooth. And this question, how many smooth cubic curves have exactly a given number of rational points, is now very close to something I like. Because a smooth cubic curve with an FQ rational point defines an elliptic curve over FQ. And uh, so one way to think about this question is to ask, how many isomorphism classes of elliptic curves over FQ have a given number of FQ points? And if you're not comfortable thinking about that kind of thing, this is almost the same question as saying, for how many pairs A and B in FQ does the equation Y squared equals X cubed plus AX plus B have a given number of solutions XY? 
in FQ. And that is something that is accessible that you can give to a student and have them play around with it for different values of Q, maybe you put in other restrictions too. I'll say that we know the answer to these questions and uh, it builds on work of Doering and Waterhouse and it involves connections to really beautiful algebraic number theory involving class numbers of orders in imaginary quadratic fields. So you can put all this together and compute this weight enumerator exactly. You could then go up and look at cubics and more variables. And there's this really interesting story about cubic surfaces that I'll leave for now, because what I want to talk about in this last bit of this section is uh, a problem that I now think about a lot, which is what happens when you try to go from cubic curves to curves of degree four. So let's look at a reed muller code that comes from evaluating polynomials of degree at most four in two variables. You want to count how many of those polynomials have a given number of zeros. And at some point, if you want to solve that problem, you have to answer this question, how many smooth cortic curves have a given number of rational points? And this is not something we know how to do right now and doesn't actually seem reasonable to write down a formula in all cases. So one way to think about it is if you give me a value of Q, and ask for the maximum number of points of a smooth cubic curve over FQ, for every Q, we know the answer. And for quartic curves, we know a lot, but we don't know the answer for every value of Q. So something more complicated is going on. So it just doesn't seem reasonable to ask to write down this weight enumerator exactly. So one of the kinds of things I like to think about is, well, what can you say about this weight enumerator? Like, Maybe you can't write down all the coefficients exactly, but you can say things about the shape of the distribution of the coefficients. Like maybe what is their average? What is their variance? Stuff like that. And this is related to something that I really, really like, which is there's a kind of symmetry to the coefficients of the weight enumerator of these codes that come from evaluating cubic polynomials that just isn't true anymore for evaluating quartic polynomials. So the next slide is gonna be like the most technical one. So don't worry about the details, but the idea is we're gonna define this function NQT that counts the number of isomorphism classes of smooth projective, forget about it, plain quartic curves with a given number of points, Q plus one minus T. And we're gonna weight each class by its number of automorphisms. Doesn't matter why we're doing that. Why Q plus one minus T? Because we know that if t is too big in absolute value, there just are no curves that have that many points. So this first chart here is take q equals 11 and graph this function. And I grabbed these from uh, a paper of Lercier, Ritzenthaler, Rovetta, Seisling, and Smith that I love. And I'll say more about that in a minute. You can also, so uh, if you did the corresponding thing for cubic curves, this graph would be symmetric about the line t equals zero, that the number of cubic curves with q plus one minus t points is the same as the number of cubic curves with q plus one plus t points. But that's just not true anymore. If you squint at this chart, you can see that there's like this little bump to the right of the t equals zero line. So going to the right means fewer points, q plus one minus t going to the left means more points. So you can graph the difference between these two halves. So define this function that is number of curves with q plus one minus t minus number of curves with q plus one plus t. And what you get is this thing that, okay, this is just one value q equals 11. But if you look at more values, you seem to be getting this curve that goes up and goes down and then goes off to zero. And like, what is it? What's happening? And this paper that I mentioned is this really beautiful combination of computational experiments and theoretical work that tries to explain what's going on here. So let me say, for people who know coding theory, number theory, maybe you feel like there's a bit of a bait and switch in this talk that I'm like, well, number theory and coding theory interact. But then what I've done is I've taken a bunch of questions that are really like number theory questions and phrased them in the language of coding theory. And what I wanna do in the next two slides is just give you a little bit of a hint of an idea 
that you can actually use ideas from coding theory to help solve these problems. And the main input is going to be if you have a, co a linear code C, there's this extra object you get to play with, the dual code. So if you have two elements in FQ to the n, you can take this kind of dot product between them, where x bracket y is just the sum from i equals 1 to n of xi times yi. For a linear code C in FQ to the n, the dual code is now everything in FQ to the n, where x bracket y equals 0 for all elements in your code. So to do this example, let's take this repetition code 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 in F2 to the n, one dimensional linear code. What is the dual? It's the set of all things in F2 to the n with even weight. So the weight enumerator of the code is x to the n plus y to the n. And the weight enumerator of the dual you can write down. It's all the things that have an even number of ones. Pick your number of ones, pick the spots. That gives the weight enumerator. But you can see that you can write this in a really nice way as x plus y to the n plus x minus y to the n over 2. And this is one instance of something that is one of my favorite theorems. I feel like there's so many favorites in this talk. I don't know. I guess it's my favorite theorem. Uh, this result of McWilliams, which says the weight enumerator of a linear code determines the weight enumerator of its dual code. So if you want the weight enumerator of the dual, you take the weight enumerator of the code and you evaluate it not as a polynomial in x and y, but you apply this transformation where you evaluate in x plus q minus 1y and x minus y, and then you divide the whole thing by the size of the code. And I'm such an algebraic person, I've never taken naturally to analysis that I feel like I just have to point out that one way to prove this, the one that I know best, involves discrete plus on summation. So every time I get to apply like a real analysis thing, I get so excited. So there you go. You should, you should look up this argument. It's awesome. And the idea that I'm trying to sell now is that if you want to figure out a thing about the weight enumerator of a code C, one way to approach it is to look at the weight enumerator of the dual code and then try to apply this identity to get information going back the other way. And there's this interesting set of questions about what's going on here um, that I will say nothing else about for now. So I wanted to make sure that I left myself like at least a couple of minutes, a minute or two, to talk about what else is there. If you go to another coding theory talk, it'll probably be very different than this one. And if you even go to an algebraic geometry and coding theory talk, it'll probably be very different than this one. I'm only giving you like a very small piece of this big, beautiful story. So let me advertise for like some other question. One big topic that you may have heard is algebraic geometry codes. So read Solomon codes, read Muller codes. These codes are great, but the parameters are really restricted. Like read Solomon codes are great, but you have a code over FQ and it has length Q or Q plus one or something like that. Maybe you need longer codes. The read Muller codes are longer, but they're not as good in some sense. So what was the common idea in these codes? Is you have some vector space of polynomials and you get this code by picking a bunch of points in FQ to the n and evaluating them. So you can take this idea and run with it. There is this big idea where there are lots of inputs from number theory to coding theory where you can construct good codes from Riemann rock spaces of divisors of algebraic curves with many FQ rational points. And if you don't know algebraic geometry, that probably sounds like a bunch of gibberish. But I want to make a point that this is not as inaccessible as you might think. There's this really wonderful book called Codes and Curves by Judy Walker that you can give to a motivated undergrad that doesn't involve any kind of algebraic geometry background, introduces coding theory, and then shows that if you want to try to solve some of these questions, why you might want to understand things about divisors on curves and the riemann rock theorem. OK. If you do know algebraic geometry, maybe you're wondering, I've never thought about coding theory before. Where can I apply the things that I know to problems that coding theory people care about? And there's this pair of books by Svassman, Vladut, and Nogen. The first one is Algebraic Geometry Codes Basic Notions. The second one is Algebraic Geometry Codes Advanced Chapters. And these are great references for that kind of reader. So 
you can give this book to a graduate student who knows a little bit of algebraic geometry. I wouldn't give it to somebody who had never seen algebraic geometry before at all. We did this at UC Irvine and it worked pretty well. Okay, last slide. This is only part of the story, right? Like, suppose you have a good code. You have this code in FQ to the N and it's got large size and large minimum distance. Like it's got the things that we want. How do you take that set of messages and then actually turn it into an efficient encoding decoding scheme? Here's a really concrete instance of that problem. I send you a message. You receive something that is not one of our agreed upon code words. How do you decide what was the thing I meant to send you? How do you find the code word that is closest to it in the Hamming distance? And for completely general codes, this sounds like impossible. But if your code has a lot of algebraic structure, like it comes from evaluating polynomials over a finite field, maybe it is a Reed Solomon code. You can use that algebraic structure to solve this decoding problem. And there's lots of really beautiful work in this direction. Uh, and again, this is now just one other direction. There are many, many more. And if you like this kind of thing, I hope you come and check out this session tomorrow. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. OK, uh, thank you, Nathan. Um, I think we maybe have time for one question, perhaps uh, more. Let me uh, ask the following. Um, uh, this uh, comes from Aram. Uh, can you say more about how the weight enumerator is related to the class number? Yeah, OK, so this is specifically for the case of these codes that come from cubic polynomials. So if you want to count the number of cubic polynomials in two variables with a given number of zeros, that really is like counting the number of elliptic curves with a given number of rational points. There is something else you have to do to go from like, here is my isomorphism class of a curve to here is how to write it as the zero set of a cubic polynomial. But the big part is counting the isomorphism classes. And then you have to use some things about elliptic curves. So for one thing, you could say uh, attached to an elliptic curve over a finite field, you have an, a ring of endomorphisms, these nice maps from the curve to itself. And you could ask, usually this endomorphism ring is an order in an imaginary quadratic field. So you can refine this counting problem from curves with a given number of points to curves with a given endomorphism ring, and then say how many isomorphism classes of curves over FQ have exactly that order in an imaginary quadratic field as its endomorphism ring. And that, using the theory of complex multiplication and all sorts of great stuff, involves the class number of that order. So yeah. OK, so I think in order for everybody to uh, get to their next talk, we're going to have to close this down. But uh, just let me say that, Nathan, you've gotten a long list of thank yous in the chat. And let me uh, join that group uh, and thanking you for uh, a wonderful talk. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in the coding theory session. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. If you have other questions, please feel free to email me. Thank you.